All right, welcome everybody to another edition of Legal Tech Week, the show where we talk about the top stories in legal tech and legal innovation. Today is June 9th, 2023, and uh, among the topics we'll be talking about today are the sanctions hearing in the uh, now remorseful uh, lawyer bogus cases case, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and bears as tools the surveillance state. Oh, looking forward to that one. Uh, and, and a few others as well. And uh, I'm Bob Ambrosi. I write the blog Law Sites and have the podcast Law Next. And um, our panelists today, which may still, we're still expecting one more. We'll see. But uh, to get started with who we have here so far, let's go around. Steve, you want to kick it off? Ah, here we uh, go. Sh- sure. Steve Embry. I write the uh, blog Tech Law Crossroads. Uh, about legal innovation and technology. And Joe, unfortunately, Stephanie joined us, which makes three black shirts and only two red shirts. But <laughs> I thought we were going to be safe. I'm on West Coast time and running behind. Sorry. <laughs> oh, well, no problem. Well, since you're talking, you want to say hello and introduce yourself? Oh, yes. Hi. I. Stephanie Wilkins, editor in chief of Legal Tech News at ALM. Where, where in the West Coast are you? I am near San Diego, kind of Carlsbad-ish at a resort. Oh. I um, spoke yesterday at a conference, so and I'm too old to do the 24-hour turnaround to the East Coast. <laughs> yeah, don't tell me that because I have to do the 24-hour turnaround Monday and Tuesday. I'm going to LA on Monday and coming back Tuesday. Yeah. Um, Nikki, you want to say hello? Uh, I'm Nikki Black. I'm the head of SME and external education at uh, My Case in Law Pay. I write legal tech columns for um, Above the Law, ABA Journal, and The Daily Record. And I also oversee and write the um, industry and benchmark reports on the My Case in Law Pay side of things. And I know that trip well. And, and uh, one nice thing about the... Um, I was just mentioning that this was the one year anniversary of Affinape acquiring um, my case. And one nice thing about that is that Affinape is located in Austin. And so my trips to California have been reduced and I mostly just fly to Austin, which is a much shorter trip with just a one hour time change. So uh, I, I feel your pain with those California trips. Well, congratulations on one year of that. It's, uh, it's amazing that that was that long ago. It just seems like it just happened not long ago. And Joe Patrice. Joe Patrice from uh, Above the Law and the Thinking Like a Lawyer podcast. I uh, have not been indicted on 37 counts of espionage. So that makes me, you know, I, I, I marked safe from that today. <laughs> uh, as a, yeah, okay. Uh, well, um, Bunch of stuff to talk about today, but uh, I thought we ought to uh, pick up and and uh, kick off with the sanctions hearing that was held yesterday in the uh, now notorious case of uh, the lawyer who cited the bogus cases relying on chat GPT, um, or at least who supposedly uh, supposedly did that. Um, Stephanie, I know you guys covered, I guess uh, somebody, uh, you, you wrote up, you had a story this morning. Not, I don't think you wrote it, but uh, yeah. Legal Tech News had a story about uh, about the hearing. Uh, what what jumped out at you about it? Yeah, I, but ALM, luckily we have a court reporter who goes to courts regularly, so I requested that they go to this one. Um, Crazy the, thing for a legal, legal journalism company to have somebody yeah, I know, who goes right? to courts. Right, I know. Um, yeah, I mean, he was obviously very contrite, but it's still just, we all, I feel like the briefing before the argument really gave it away. And somebody else, not us, did a Twitter post, like a, basically a live tweeting of the judge's questioning, which was harsh, but I think justified. Um, and they're just still really doubling down on this was a highly touted research tool. How would we have known that it was not a thing we should use. And I don't know. And the, the thing that the comment in the briefing that really like made me want to throw my computer across the room was, <laughs> no, it really, it was like, oh, he's, he doesn't need to be sanctioned. He's already become the poster child for dabbling with new technology. 
And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like that is like, you're missing the point again. And you're reinforcing the idea that, oh, it's our fault for trying a new technology. I'm like, no, you didn't even bother to learn what the technology was. Um, so the judge obviously has not actually issued his ruling yet. He's going to do it in writing at some point. Um, if you see the live tweet of the questions, they were pretty brutal. Um, but it wasn't even just that. There were like, apparently there was a point where they had lied to the court about who was on vacation for needing an extension. Like it was, it's all just a hot mess. And yeah. I mean, I don't wish ill on people very often. Like, I'm not, I'm not, this is not a personal thing. This is a horrible incident, but like, I feel like there needs to be an example made here because I'm sure this has happened more and we just haven't seen those cases yet. And it's going to keep happening. And I, I, I don't know, it's just, there needs to be something said about this, but it also needs to be very clear that it wasn't the tech's fault, it's the lawyer's fault. It, and we should point out that in, in proof, in, in furtherance of proving that he's already become the, the poster child for uh, tech incompetence or whatever, he actually included a, uh, uh, a, a teaser for this very show in which we were going to be talking <laughs> about him. And <laughs> so uh, there you go. Uh, and, uh, and in addition to that, there was another they, they included in one in as exhibits a, another post that I did talking about a chat GPT based legal research tool, apparently as 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 evidence of why uh, why they should have come to rely on it as a legal research tool. But but yeah, hot mess is, is exactly the right uh, the right phrase for describing that hearing yesterday. It seems like um, I don't know what, what did others think. I, I think I told you, Bob, before we before we went live, that probably the person most happy about this is the uh, is the lawyer that appeared as a cat at a, at a hearing a few years ago. Is he will no longer be the sole butt of jokes and will no longer be the only example that is given by all of us in our presentations about technology and, and, and competency requirements. Uh, we now at least have two and maybe this one's even worse. So he may not get mentioned at all. <laughs> oh, I feel like the, the cat lawyer seems so tame now compared to this that came up last night at uh there was like a happy hour for this conference I'm at and people brought that up too. everyone it's the best comparison we have to complete tech incompetence and honestly at the end of the day being a cat is way better than fabricating an entire brief and tripling down on it and lying about vacation time and all of the above <laughs> it just seemed like this this guy has such a lack of respect for the court and the court process the entire time you know oh the court's saying that you know i signed a document that um and submitted fake cases i'll just rely on this guy to respond and i'm not going to bother to even read his response or the cases that he cites in response like you know he just kept not it couldn't be bothered with this court over here is what it felt like and even in the when he was questioned about this by the judge he just he just sort of seemed like, I don't know, he just it didn't like he didn't really take this seriously, you know, and he uh, it just shows a disrespect for the court, I think. And, and I that think throughout the oh, yeah, throughout I mean, this the, process. Oh, OK, go for oh, it. I was going to say that's a very short point, but I thought that was also very interesting that we've all been focusing on Schwartz, but he had another person here and the judge was equally harsh on the other attorney for just signing off on things. And I, I think that's important and the thing we haven't talked about a lot. But sorry, Joe, go ahead. No, yeah, no, I I think both attorneys, uh, and I think this applies just as much, like you said, to the attorney who signed off on it. We we were clear in our coverage, and if they'd actually listened to our show, they might not have put it in their uh, affidavit. Uh, both attorneys seem to not only not understand what we keep saying, that this is really a question of practice and professionalism and not technology, they seem to be Every time they made an answer, it seemed like they weren't even tracking that that might be the issue. Like, it, and clearly, coverage. I mean, maybe they just aren't reading the legal tech coverage. We've all been saying it, but everybody's answers to every question seemed to be like, well, yes, 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 we hear that. But it seemed like the technology lied to us. It's like, yeah, nobody's, we're all past that. Other than the New York Times and the mainstream folks early on, the rest of us are past that. Uh, and the judge seems well past that, yeah. shall we say. Yeah, no, and I was saying that yesterday, like, it's not, Ch ChatGPT did exactly what ChatGPT does. Like, it, it did its thing. That's why you're not supposed to use it. And I think you're totally right. Like, at no point are they even 
clocking the notion that, oh, maybe we should have looked into this tool more. Maybe we should have actually thought about what we were using before we used it rather than just blaming it. Yeah. I think the part, part of so much of the problem, the reason this is not the same as the cat lawyer is the cat lawyer was legitimately, I think, uh, naive and confused about the technology. Uh, in this case, it just doesn't pass the smell test. There's something else going on here. I mean, the fact that they lied about the vacation, the fact that they lied about the notarization, uh, you know, and, and just as the judge was saying, you know, the judge is like, read these cases that you supposedly you know, that you thought were real cases, they're gobbledygook, they don't even make sense. I mean, didn't, you know, it, it something is just not right here, it feels like, I don't know. Yeah, I and think like, it's with more, the cat lawyer, like... sorry, with the cat say... lawyer, he was using, the cat lawyer was using a tool that he should use, it was just a weird feature of it that he just didn't quite get. This is just so off base. Sorry, Steve, go ahead. Yeah, I think it was, it's really more like the, the do not pay guy who, you know, he's trying to blame technology for his own lack of uh, competence and and uh, you know being being careful and cautious and scrutinizing what he's using and not making false claims. I mean, the, the cat lawyer was he wasn't blaming the technology as much as he was just embarrassed. Yeah. And, and he, I think actually he has kind of come out of that and has sort of embraced it and said, you know. <laughs> I'm the poster child for for for, not, for for being sure you know what to do with your technology. Yeah, that was just silly. He wasn't, you know, signing off, you know, on, with notarized signatures about what he was submitting. That he wasn't submitting anything. He just pushed the wrong button. You know, that's very different than what happened here, where you're purporting that you, you know, even if someone else did the work, that you read what they did and you're signing off on it. And you do it, you did, he did it multiple times. Meanwhile, there's other guys over there just randomly asking chat GPT stuff and acting like it's a legit thing, you know, because he read about it somewhere and he thought it was a search engine. It's not, you know, it's like, yeah. Yeah. The, the craziest that, thing that I dealt that was a good oh. excuse. <laughs> right. The, cra the, the craziest part of it for me is, and you know, we have a columnist who's also been covering this, who's not from the tech side. Uh, and when I, what's interested me is how being not from the tech side, she has a very, she has the a very dim view of the lawyers, as in she sees conspiracy all the way around. She sees that like they probably wrote these cases themselves in an attempt to make it seem like GPT. And I was like, no, I'm going with Occam's razor. It will do this stuff. If you give it the opportunity, it will do the, all of this crazy stuff. Like why, what incentive did they have to write up fake ones after the fact? No, they just, they trusted a thing because they're dumb and then they refused to do the research. It, it's well, a pretty simple solution. Yeah. And they it's doubled pretty, yes. and tripled yeah. down on it. That's the thing. Like even if right. they made the first mistake, which was egregious and terrible and incompetence and sanctionable, yeah, they then doubled and tripled down on using the yeah. tool the person who did it and the person who signed off on it. Like they, like they were all in on all of these errors. <laughs> maybe, yeah, you know, it's maybe, just they like, asked, maybe they asked chat GPT how they should respond to the judge. <laughs> yes, like that's the thing. It's like, they, and you know, like these, these lawyers are older and you uh, would assume that they should know better uh, on this front. But this goes back to what we were talking about last week about how there are, there's a generational problem. Uh, rarely do I say the kids aren't all right. But one of the issue where I think that that's true is that there is a burgeoning generational problem where folks don't think about the idea of looking at another source. They look at one source and if they don't get the answer they want, they think, well, maybe I should ask a better question of that, of Google, uh, whatever, uh, as opposed to saying, hey, maybe the problem is I need to go to the library or I need to look at a journal or whatever. And even though these are more experienced lawyers, that seems to be the issue here. They were told Chat GPT led them astray, so they went, "Is that right, Chat GPT?" Yeah, <laughs> and, right. just and, and they had already they had gotten themselves in that position in the first place because they had supposedly gone to Fastcase, and then they somehow they had let their subscription lapse or something for for yeah. the federal cases in Fastcase. I, I actually had to fact check that one because I thought fact check fake case fast case was all inclusive uh, and included federal. Too. If you got state cases, you got federal cases. But I, turns I did out. That too. <laughs> Turns out in New York there is a separate subscription that for for the federal cases. Um, 
But, you know, again, if they if they realized, you know, I, I mean, they, they could have coughed off the ex, extra couple of hundred bucks or whatever it would cost to get the subscription to federal cases, or if they realized Fastcase wasn't doing it. I mean, again, you can just judge said, go to the go to so the, many other sources that you can go to. They don't cost anything. Yeah. That's what the judge said. The judge said, yeah. couldn't you have driven to the, I don't know if it was the court or the law library. There's somewhere where it was available on their computers. They could access Lexis. Couldn't you have done that? Yeah. Yeah. And he very, the judge very clearly was like, you've been doing this for 30 years. How have you done research in the past? <laughs> and they were like mm -hmm. libraries. They like mentioned all these things. He's like, and so you couldn't do that again. And then they were like, well, we thought these cases were real. He's like, we just thought they were unreported. And the judge is like, you've been a lawyer for 30 years. What do you think this site, you know, F3rd means? They're like, oh, it's whatever. And he's like, well, then if you know that is the reference to a publication, how could you think this was an unreported case? Yep. Well, if someone asked any tips on top reliable sources, resources for case references. Correct me if I'm wrong, but last I knew with a fast case iPhone app, it's free and you can site check cases in it for free. Last I knew you could do that, even if you didn't have a subscription to fast case. So I mean, that's you just do it on like, Google. Type type a citation into right. your Google, Google search Scholar. bar, and it's going to come up on Case Text. It's going to come up on Fast Case. It's going to come up right. on Google Scholar. It's going to come up on all on Justia. It's going to come up on all sorts of sources. If it doesn't come up, then you got to wonder what's going on. No, that's exactly what I was going to say. Even if you can't access ultimately the resources, if you type a case citation into the Google search bar, you will see if it produces an actual case. Whether or not you can actually access the case, you can find out if cases exist. Yeah. And but I also like the point in the comments there, like that, yeah, ultimately having these fast case wouldn't probably have helped them because they didn't really have good case law on their side. But um, right. Well, that's part of the issue here, right? Yeah. I mean, did they did they and that's part of what makes us all a little suspicious is when they found that there weren't really any cases that supported the argument they were trying to make. Eh, did they want to did they were they just you know, was, was yeah, this intentional like, <laughs> malfeasance they, like, or negligence? I don't know. It's so naive because that's exactly what they said. They're like, oh, well, you know, we weren't finding anything. So we use this magic new research, the what it was like search engine we heard about. They called it a search engine. Search, we use this yeah, magic yeah. new search engine we heard about and it produced stuff. So we just thought it had stuff no one else had. Yeah. Well, we've all been in that it's, position you know, where there's just no case law on your side. It doesn't mean you get to make it up. Right. You know, like just pull it out of thin air. And if, well, so, if you, you know, can't find it anywhere and suddenly you find it in a new magic place, maybe be a little bit skeptical. It's it's akin to, you know, what, what lawyers, I frequently saw lawyers do when they, were, <clears throat> they would use like Westlaw head notes and they would they would use those as uh, as if they were authority and in the case itself. And then when you would read the case, if you were on the other side, you would discover that the head note didn't get it even close to right. And so you know, the argument would always be, you can't rely on head notes. You've got to read the case to see and if it says actually, what it's supposed to say. Yeah, That was actually a point that when we were talking, um, our reporter Isha was talking to <clears throat> judges and people about those the court orders about you have to sign the certification about AI. And that's exactly what, kind of what Judge Peck said, because he said it wasn't necessary. He's like, when I was practicing, I could tell immediately if somebody had not read a case or only read the case note and when they signed it. Like, yeah. I'm not an idiot. Yeah. yeah. Somebody asked in the Q and A, as opposed to the chat, of when is someone going to write the definitive article that makes it clear to the entire legal industry that Chat GPT isn't fit for legal research? Well, I Come just you, wrote folks, when are you going to write that? I thought I did. <laughs> I thought we all did. <laughs> I think we've all been saying that. Apparently, we? like the right people aren't reading them. Though. None of us are definitive. Is the problem? Yeah, but it, but like well, but it, it can be used will... for a lot of other things. It's just legal research. It's not great for, but you can use it for all sorts of other things right now, summarizing documents, um, drafting forms that you can then edit. You know, there's so many different things you can use it for still, but legal research isn't one of them. Well, I mean, well, and this is, and this is that, wait. Go ahead, Joe. Oh, this is the point where I, I am reticent to do this because I hate having to sound like Stephanie here, but <laughs> this is the distinction oh, between, chat, between chat GPT and the underlying algorithms. Like, the underlying algorithms are probably great for legal research. You just need to attach them to a legal research database, not have them play around grabbing from all the stuff that they scanned and trained on, like Bob's website, uh, which, while very valuable for a lot of things, is not a legal research website, you know? Uh, yes. And that's the thing. Like, we all talked about how 
Bob's website is one of the ones that it trained on. Uh, but like it needs to train on Westlaw or Lexus or something like that. And until it does that, GP, GPT will chat. GPT doesn't didn't do that. So it won't do it right. But yeah. Well, and exactly. I'm sorry. Day. Yes. I, I'm glad you said sound like Stephanie because I was doing this back in yeah. January and you all were laughing yeah. at me. And I'm like, it matters the difference between chat GPT and like to correct, sorry, the person in the comments, like yeah. co counsel like, is not based on chat GPT. That's exactly the point. It is based on. Like GPT four. It is like, and right. there is a difference. And I'm actually going to work and make an. And it's trained against this. legal documents. Is the other thing. Yes. It's not just trained against the large language models. So it's trained against the primary so, legal resources. Yeah. But, and so the, back the, in the, January, I, when you were all laughing at me and being like, "Oh, Stephanie's going to talk about this again," like, look where we are now. Maybe Schwartz and Laduca <clears> should have been listening then. Like, listen, listen. I'm judge should order them you, to watch but... the show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Watch I mean, the show you cite. At the end of the day, I mean, it. the walk away advice to lawyers is, I mean, you got to read the damn cases, you know, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I can't tell you how many times in my career when I was practicing awful times I would, the other side, I never did it, but they would cite, they would cite stuff in their materials and you went to read the case and it wasn't there. I mean, and it was just off wrong. Other people's work without checking it, if it's yeah. someone that's work for you. All right. We we before we lose Nick Rishwade, we have to we have to talk about bears in the surveillance state because he came to this show in the audience today just to hear us talk about bears and surveillance. So let's not disappoint him, Joe. Yeah, <laughs> that so, would be your cue. No. Yeah, no, I know. When no, it comes I to bears writing... in the surveillance state, we turn to our resident expert. So I was right. I was just writing the timestamp down. Uh, yeah, no. So. This one started cropping up on my radar earlier this week. There were, uh, I got, we get press releases at Above the Law from a lot of legal advocacy groups across the spectrum. And I got one from the right libertarian leaning Institute for Justice, like celebrating that someone has finally going to bring a search and seizure case against the vile state government who used a bear to spy on a couple's house. And I was like, that's, <laughs> That's interesting. And then I saw a bunch of other fairly right leaning uh, libertarian social media accounts talking about how wild it is that they deputized a bear to law enforcement and put a camera on it because they knew it's migrant, it's like little path, migratory path, whatever, went on to this couple's estate, like 100 acre plus acre estate. And so they put this camera on it so it would go in there and take pictures. And I was like, that is interesting and seems bad, warrantless search sort of situation. But I kept thinking, and this is really like a real time how I approach this story as they kept coming in. I just kept <laughs> thinking, it doesn't really matter constitutionally what the crime is uh, for this sort of stuff necessarily. I guess the way I would say is... Uh, it doesn't necessarily bear upon the the issue, but <laughs> but like I was thinking, like, do they have a meth lab or something that they're trying to get? Like, what is it? Why why would anybody send a bear to do this job? And <laughs> it took me a while. I eventually found a local newspaper talking about this couple, where I figured it out that the issue is. They're accused of feeding bears and like luring them into <laughs> residential areas because they feed them. And all I can think is, yes, that is the definition of a reasonable search if you put a camera on a bear to figure out who's feeding it. It has nothing to do with them like going into these people's property and using it to spy on their house. They put it on the goddamn bear to figure out whether or not it was who. It was stealing picnic baskets from. And I, I just, I was struck by the disingenuousness of the way in which this was presented by everybody. Like, oh no, this is, this is like a new put aside drones. The new drone is, is Yogi. And I was like, it's not. It absolutely was a question of wildlife regulation. Ah. I can't. I really, I, I, I really yeah. want to be in the meeting where the one person was like, just hear me out, undercover bear. 
Like, <laughs> <laughs> Undercover bear. Yeah, I didn't put that joke in the piece. I, I really wish I had because I, I was, I mean, this is a, there's a lot of puns involved in this piece, uh, as one might imagine. But uh, yeah, I, anyway, so that's a way technology can be used. Uh, it could be used to spy on things. Uh, that said, using it to figure out what a bear is eating and to enforce wildlife management probably is not a constitutional case. On the other <laughs> hand, I didn't think about what the founders would have thought of this. I mean, <laughs> Clarence Thomas might have some some hot takes from Thomas I mean, Jefferson this, on Well, this bears. goes back to my like my law school constitutional law class because I don't know the answer to this, but don't they have to have been are there fourth amendment rights implicated when they haven't been charged with anything in the first place? So, uh, yes, you can, yeah. you, even if you haven't been charged, that you can be subject to an unreasonable search and seizure. That said, uh, one, I think this is pretty reasonable, but also there's, the Supreme Court has roundly, to sound like I'm from Big Lebowski, they have roundly rejected <laughs> the idea that you have a, first, a Fourth Amendment right in the privacy of your own property if your own property is an open field. Uh, in this case, it's forested, but the point remains. The, you, you really only have that expecta expectation of privacy in the curtilage. That's your uh, bar exam vocabulary word. word of the day. Curtilage. Yeah, uh, You really only have that in the small area around your house. It, it, this is 117 acres worth of property. You don't really have a privacy interest in the area where they allegedly put a bunch of bear feeders so that they could draw like they laid out a bunch of just right porridge in the in the back <laughs> acres and brought people in and it yeah like you don't have an interest in that now they say that the the complaint alleges that the bears got within 200 yards of the house fine uh it, that that starts entering the idea where you could start to maybe think it's curtilage uh and they claim that the camera on it was able to look in their house but even but so, i think the can't you, yeah can't you yeah i mean i was a criminal defense lawyer in fourth amendment all the time if you if you can reasonably see into somebody's house with a camera you know what I mean? Then that's okay if their windows right. are wide open. So that's what I, I don't even understand where this is going because even if it's a camera attached to a bear, if the camera can see what the camera can see, it, it, as long yes. as it's not, you know, I don't, I don't see how that's necessarily as right. much. Right, and and now I will say about that point that that is true. And I actually, when I was in law school, I attended a, I mean, I actually put on my journal, put on this uh, this seminar about this issue. And uh, Erwin Chemerinsky, who at the time was a law professor, but now is the dean at Berkeley, uh, he spoke and actually gave an interesting case for that becoming a dangerous technology issue that we've always said that the line is, if you can reasonably see in the house, but now we have technology where you can see in the house from a mile away, like, what do we do with that? Uh, and that is interesting. But it's also one of those situations where what's the abuse here like fruit of the poison tree no one is going to bring a claim against these people based on what they saw in the house unless of course they are sleeping in the just right bed but assuming they uh, they just fed these bears clear out in the back 40 then nobody cares what happened in the house it's not going to lead to any charge it can easily be excluded from anything like the cure for this potential arguable constitutional violation seems so simple i don't know yeah and if they were trying to lure bears they weren't trying to lure bears to their house it seems just like incidental yeah. that this happened also can i note that this might be my favorite discussion we've ever had on the show and there were so <laughs> many mean, terms there were so many terms like out, they were like out, uh, bar exam terms in there we should definitely do like a bar exam prep show for people it would be awesome <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think about how effective, <laughs> what, how effective is it to put a camera on it? If they really did want to spy on these people right with this camera, I mean, bears kind of lumber around. You can't quite control where they go or what they do. The camera is going to be going all over the place. It's not like you're going to get a shot of in their living room window or in their kitchen as they're putting out a bowl of food for the bear or something. I mean, 
Wouldn't a I'm, drone I'm, have been better? Well, maybe still, they were yeah, very, very good at luring bears because this bear went right where they wanted it to go. Well, I'm still trying to get my head around on how did they put the damn camera on the bear to begin with? I mean, yes, I would like, like photos come on here. I'm, I want to put this thing on you so we can catch those people that are feeding you the good food. <laughs> the GoPro. You know, Probably the go, shit that you GoPro. like. Uh, that, you know. <laughs> a skateboarding bear. <laughs> I mean, look, it... What what are the, what's the acronym? A cab. All cops are bears. Yeah, they're. Uh, <laughs> eh? Yogi, Yogi and Boo Boo. I, well, I mean, <laughs> that, I, I did a pic, I did a picnic basket reference in there. I I really tried to get every bear reference I could into this story, and I I struggled with a couple of them. I couldn't find a, a Paddington bear way a, angle here. I couldn't get the Bernstein or Baron Stain. Stain. Depending what, yeah. Depending on what universe you're in. You're all familiar with that, right? That it's a okay. different universe. Yes. This this goes this goes to Nikki's simulation theory. It is uh, a different universe that we're all in because we all remember the Berenstein bears, but apparently they never existed and they've always been Baron Stain. So yeah. One of, that's but one of the many we, we now have two two ones. different poems, chat GPT. One from CJ yeah. here and one from Nikki on uh, using curtilage, bear curtilage Aww. and forage. Mm. Wow. I tried to type the whole that, thing in, but it was And too none long. of us are going to be sanctioned for this. That's the good thing. <laughs> <laughs> so that's least, my work. At least that we oh. know of. Oh, so that's what I did tech-wise this week. So good. worth it. Thank you. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel like... I feel like Where there's nothing else there? to talk about. It. <laughs> <laughs> um, we co we yeah. co covered the high points. <laughs> we have we have covered the high points. Although I mean, there there actually it could be a a sort of a transition uh, from from cameras on bears to facial recognition algorithms used by police, uh, which is a story Nikki had. Did we talk about that. That's the one that I actually did want to talk about. I submitted to, but this one I thought was more interesting. My other one was just, I went over plugins for um, ChatGPT and provided some that I thought lawyers could use. Yeah, that's boring. Yeah, that is boring. So I maybe <laughs> put a link to that one, but it's useful. Oh, but, but almost this, as boring as my cybersecurity post. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this one really caught my eye. Um, it's not boring. I didn't mean that, Nikki. You know. Well, I mean, it Com is, compared to bears and cameras. Yeah, nothing on like bears. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, but, uh, the, this one I thought was interesting because uh, it harkens back to my criminal defense roots and um, uh, essentially a, a court decide um, concluded that the defendant, um, the police have to give the defendant the underlying algorithm for the facial recognition tech that was being used against him. Um, you know, and that um, is akin to the, uh, and I sort of been waiting for this because I've talked about this in the past in DWI defense you know, uh, people always seek the algorithms and the software behind the breathalyzers. And so I've sort of been waiting for somebody to um, get a good ruling on this. And this is a great case for that. And it's a really important one at this particular point in time too, because um, with ChatGPT and generative AI, um, I just read an article today about how the um, biases are um, behind the programming and also the database are, um, showing up in these tools too, not surprisingly. Um, the concern with facial recognition in general has always been that the, um, the data that is used to train it uh, is such that this, the facial recognition is really good at recognizing white dudes, but when it comes to people of color or women, it has, does a really bad job at identifying their faces accurately because of the data set and also the people who program the AI. And that's why you wanna get a look at the underlying technology and the underlying algorithm so that you can see if there are biases built in um, and also get a sense of how accurate is this. But the same thing's happening with ChatGPT. So when they ask ChatGPT um, and tools like it, they'll actually provide the images, um, you know, GPT powered technology or the like, provide me with 20 pictures of judges or 20 pictures of, uh, inmates, you know, it will almost, you know, it will provide you with mostly white dudes for judges and mostly black men as inmates. Um, 
And even though the population, the article I was reading is, you know, 50% of inmates um, right now in the United States are uh, people of color and the rest are Caucasian. And yet it's skewed. And so, you know, you're seeing these same biases pop up in, um, uh, you know, GPT powered or generative AI software from these large language models. Um, so it's a really big problem. And if you ask it, you know, show me a, an attorney, it's, it's going to show you a bunch of men, you know, white men. Um, and so, you know, you just end up with all these bias problems. And so I think it's um, notable that the judge actually ruled that the algorithm was, um, could be turned over and that the defendant could um, review it. And I think that um, it's an important ruling and hopefully more courts will do that, especially as we sort of head into this generative AI age, you know, where this is going to be the tech that prevails. Was this, do you know if this was a first or, or have other courts ruled on this before? That I, it's the first one that I've seen. That does not mean that it's the first. Um, but it, it is a pretty, um, I think that it's an unusual. I mean, the, this was from EFF, Electronic Fron, uh, Frontier Foundation. Um, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, when they cover these things, it's usually because it's pretty notable. Um, and so um, I think that it's, I don't know if it's the first, but there aren't many that are doing it. I don't think yeah. at this point. Um, and I think it's important, you know, and I don't think that you should just assume that this algorithm that's going to determine whether somebody goes to jail or not, you should, the defense should be able to look at it and have their own experts examine it and um, pick it apart if necessary. If someone's going to get the death penalty somewhere, they should absolutely be able to look at this. And it doesn't matter what the penalty is. If they're going to be wrong, wrongfully convicted, they should have a right to look at it. And also there's a link to the chat GPT plugins, should you be curious, but I don't have to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it makes total sense. I mean, it's akin to, you know, challenging the, uh, you know, I don't know, the, the calibration and breathalyzer uh, tests and uh, things like that. I mean, it, you know, you, you should, as a defendant, be able to look at the, uh, the sort of the, the, the technology that's underlying whatever, whatever technology is being used to convict you so that you can go in and decide to, to you know, find out whether there are ways to ways to challenge it or biases built into it or whatever. So, uh, you know, actually I, I, somewhere along the way, I met this, this guy who had claimed to have created an algorithm that would detect biases in other algorithms. And he was trying to sell this product. And also, I don't know about selling your product, but I think you got a hell of a career as an expert witness. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, we've, we're moving towards an entire book of poetry here uh, in, in the chat. Uh, we, we may have to just have to publish this whole thing. Uh, I, I, I do. Uh, I think I mentioned last week, I did finally figure out I, I do get the chat. I haven't figured out a way to share it other than I can copy and paste it and publish it. So uh, next week when I uh, when I uh, publish uh, this show, the link to the show, I'll, I'll uh, put all of this in there uh, so we can we can all uh, delight in these bare poems, bare, bare, bare necessities, justice, bare justice. <laughs> Is that a word? No. Um, yeah, I couldn't even get Baloo in there. I really tried. Like, yeah, no, it was uh, the story did involve a lot of decision making. I got a Gummy Bears reference in there, though. Anyway. Oh, which I just read and I loved. That one was great. Well, thank you. <laughs> and and this last poem even has an ode to Joe Patrice in it, so that's that's even better. Yeah, always better. With a very strong and sturdy heart, clearly accurate. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, yeah that that is a joke about the fact that I have a pacemaker. I think, but is. yes, which is true. I'm a jerk. It's, uh, yeah, but Joe which would she find knows. It funny. <laughs> well, Steve, did you want to talk about ChatGPT and malware? Did you pick that up this week? Yeah, well, it was a uh, uh, thanks to our our friend Doug Austin. It was in his newsletter. Um, he had come across an article uh, about the sort of the cybersecurity dangers of Chat GPT, and you know I'd read several times, sort of in passing, that that the the platform has the ability to write code, uh, and I didn't think much about it, but. Apparently, you even though it's it's got filters uh, applied that prevent it from writing malicious code, you can get around that by instead of saying write me a code, you can write me a bad code that a malicious code that does such and such. You can just say write me a code that would accomplish these things, and it will spit out a 
a, a bad code, some malware code that you can use, which, you know, is kind of dangerous and probably correctable. But in the article, um, one of the persons interviewed with it was a cybersecurity expert. And his, his view was that we could rapidly get to the point where the only the only thing that can detect malware written, written by generative AI is other AI programs, which is really, you start thinking about it, I guess that's that's probably true. The other example they used of it was a was a piece of malware that when it's embedded and, is, and the app is accessed, it will uh, surreptitiously contact chat GPT and ask chat GPT to mutate the code so the malware can't be detected, which is which is really, really scary. So the, sort of the cybersecurity aspects of all of this is, uh, I think, starting to bubble up. And it's kind of particularly troublesome when you consider people like, like our friend in New York using chat GPT when he doesn't know anything about it and law firms and lawyers using it without really understanding his cybersecurity risks that they don't understand generally, much less in connection with generative AI. So, uh, you know, I, I just thought it was a pretty interesting take and one I hadn't thought about it. What, what, what these programs could do if they are, if they are used maliciously. Warren, Warren asks, can GPT manage to code effective malware that isn't already in the public domain somehow, though? I feel like the answer would be yes. <laughs> I would assume yes. I mean, I, yeah. I am not a coder, well, but I've heard it's great at coding, it, it, so. It, you know, and that's kind of the thing. I mean, if it, if it can mutate the code that it's given, like, at what point can it start doing things that we can't really control? Um, so I don't, you know. I mean, I'm a big proponent of the, all the uses of chat GPT, but it's still, it troubles me a little bit that, that we've got some of these things, some of these black box kind of things in there that could, could create dangers that are entirely unforeseen. The article also gets into the, to the regulatory nightmare that, that it's creating because it's, it's moving so fast, you know, you, it's, and regulators don't understand it, you know, as it is today, much less as it's could be tomorrow that regulation could prove very, very difficult. <laughs> well, I think that the danger right now is that the potential, uh, what bad actors can do with this technology. It, it significantly amplifies their ability to wreak havoc in whatever context they choose to wreak havoc. It allows them to do it much more quickly. It allows them to do it uh, much more effectively. And so I, I I think that that's our initial problem. Like that's what we're gonna face initially. I do think we also, as people are talking about in the chat, it's gonna be a threat to humanity. I think at some point we're gonna to get to that point that too. But in the meantime, it's going to be like ruined by capitalism and by um, bad actors using it for bad reasons. And then it's gonna to get to the point where we're all gonna die from it. So that's the sad part. Well, and yeah, and it's, <laughs> it's still the fundamental problem with, with all the cybersecurity stuff is you know, the bad guys, the good guys are always reacting what the bad guys do, right? So it's hard for the good guys to, to become proactive and try to meet every challenge that a bad guy could come up with. And the same thing is true here. Um, Which is like a comment I got a lot when I like I did that post on, like I did the poll to our readers, like, should we do the pause, that six months pause, blah, blah, blah. And everyone's like, bad actors aren't gonna pause ever. Like, that's just not, it's not gonna get us anywhere. <laughs> P yeah. pause P A W S. I know I'm giggling like a child. <laughs> That's we just can't get away from the bears, you know. <laughs> Why would we so want to control that was more, herself? That was more fun. <laughs> Listen, it it's very very important that we focus. <laughs> get yeah. back to what, yeah. But we have a running joke in our team Slack channel. It's the actual quote from the, the Senate Judiciary Committee where, you know, Sam Altman talked and stuff like that. And I don't remember who said it, but one of the questioners was like, talking, basically referencing the fear of like, AI will kill us and hurt us while we're dying. And like, so we just like constantly like use the and hurt us while we're dying, like as our running joke. Yeah, I think we're going to have to, in, in our uh, panelists' agreement that you all sign, I think we're going to have to add in a bear clause. Uh, oh. Just, 
If only there were a panelist yeah. agreement that you all signed. Applause, I mean, uh, right? Yeah. Did, oh, Vision Pro. Oh, well, we could talk about Vision Pro. Um, yeah. Okay. So I will say real quick before people talk about it more seriously. My <laughs> recap. Nobody my wants recap to talk about the, seriously. I don't think. I think we passed my that re- moment. <laughs> my recap of the online conversation about the Apple Vision Pro release are people who are simultaneously angry about how stupid and dumb it is and how expensive it is and how they can't afford it. That's the exact same people with both stances. Like everyone is sour grapesing this thing. Like, I don't know, like it, it is, it's not necessarily world changing, but every, but I think it's actually a lot better than anything else I've seen in a long time. And all of these people online are, this is so stupid. Plus it's $3,500. And I was like, are you just no, mad? Cause you can't buy one. See, I, yeah. I, I that, think that it price is going will to be, drop fast. I think it is going to be fundamentally changing because when you think mm-hmm. about it, you know, most people now have either a laptop or a desktop and one or two monitors by which they do their work. And mm-hmm. if, if this device can do what it's represented to do, you no longer need the computer or the laptop and the monitors because it's all in one headset. And that's the that's a makes the price more attractive. And by the way, it wasn't the most expensive product that was offered <laughs> during the keynote. There was a, one of the computers yeah. was more expensive, was ten thousand uh, so, or something like that. But yeah, I'm so, wearing one of those and, on your head. I I I have a metal one. And I, I'm telling yeah, you, this is they're heavy and they start to hurt your eyes and they start to. Yeah, hurt this your is head. not supposedly. Yeah, this you is know, not. But the heavy. thing about it is, thing about all this is, is think about the iPhone. You think about the iPad, you think about these things, you think about the watch. I mean, you know what? everybody said the same thing about every one of those. And, and now, now we use them constantly, every single day, well, well most of us do. Mike, hey, everybody Mike everybody was laughing about those portable air purifiers you wear over your face until last yeah. week. And then suddenly everybody's walking right. around. Everybody down wanted down. one. <laughs> My takeaway on it is it, it is much lighter because the like for Nikki's benefit, like the the big VR sets that you currently have have the battery and the computing power, everything in it. These push a lot of that into different places. Like the battery is something you put in your pocket now, so that way they made it lighter and lighter. It's more like ski goggles. That said, I uh, I actually think it's game changing not for what Apple's doing with it, but for how it's going to inspire the rest of the world. Facebook famously is ahead on a lot of the technology VR wise, but they came up with the world's stupidest application of it with the metaverse. Cause like who wants to talk as avatars anyway, the point is, uh, (laughs) uh, uh, yeah. uh, But the point is they botched the application of this technology that they're sitting on and i felt like apple at the end of that presentation apple had basically made a case for you know if you oriented your technology around this sort of an application you actually could have business i suspect Mm -hmm. that apple's you know whatever but this is going to re-inspire htc and uh and facebook to get this right well, and I it'll, actually thought it was. The, uh, it, it'll make the remote versus in office debate a lot more lively, that's for sure. Which I still can't get my head around all these law firms that are saying, get your ass back to the office four days a week and that's it. Yeah. It amazes me. That but, was a big story anyway. for us this week. And yeah. I and I actually think it was like a really smart move on their part because if you, I mean, I didn't watch the whole thing, but people you knew who did said, you know, they didn't say artificial intelligence a single time in it. And Apple has always been a company that does consumer products. And as unlike every other big tech company out there, they're not going to, they're not trying to pretend like, oh, we're the next in AI, we're the next in whatever. And like, they're Apple, who knows, nine months from now, they'll might surprise us with something that they've been doing stealth with AI for, you know, for a while and not rolling it out. But they're doubling down on what they do best while everyone else just sort of, I mean, Facebook changed its name to Meta and then basically abandoned the metaverse to and pursue AI. Meta. Like yeah. they're doing what they do. And I actually think that's smart as a company. I did, I do give credit to um, the Washington Post for their headline about it because it was brilliant. It was like Apple made the best face computer, but it's still a face computer. Like I just, I brilliant. It was so good. But no, I mean, I what? think it's really cool. It has a lot of evolution to come, but um, I think it's an awesome thing they're doing. 
All right. What so I, what so I haven't this heard is anybody an, say oh. yet is whether it works for people who are blind in one eye. Because oh. I, I used to have, at some point, somebody offered me one of the, what was it, Google Glass, is it what they would called it? And I couldn't use it because I'm blind in my right eye and it only worked in your right eye. They didn't have a left so, eye version of it. So the, uh, the 3D applications of it probably would not. Uh, yeah, because there I are a lot of 3D stereo. applications. Yeah. yeah, but the other stuff probably would be valuable. Uh, but I was actually going to say, uh, to make this a little bit about legal tech, I thought was interesting like, like about this. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> that's about technology and the law, which is slightly different okay. than legal yeah, tech. Yeah. But right. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. anyway, um, so to make this slightly legal tech, I one takeaway I had from it was that the WWDC, which is a W's are a weird thing to uh, apostrophize. <laughs> They're like such a long word. And it, 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 just to say that letter. Anyway, that <laughs> the Apple conference, uh, the Apple conference, they when they unveiled this, they began with the presentation showing its work applications before right. its home applications, which I thought was significant because that's yeah, too. A, not a, not Apple's game generally to be work related. Some people have hypothesized it had to do with the price, but I actually thought that like maybe they really think they've got something that has real work from home applications because yeah. Apple is not a right. workplace. Yeah. So I think they really are going to lean into the work from home argument. Uh, apologies to Davis Polk and Scadden for deciding to abandon that. <clears throat> but if well, they so really do that, yeah, I mean, you just think about dealing with documents that are, you know, appear to be yeah. large and on the wall and, and five, six, seven, eight, as opposed to monitors, or having this conversation where everybody, you know, appears life size. I mean, it's, the, I think the work applications are significant and will, will change a lot because, of, I mean, the price point is not that bad when you're thinking about work. And so now we just, you know, to me, it's a, just a different sort of computer. You see, everybody life size, but make... you can't project yourself, right? Isn't that how it right? Works? It, well, well, that sort of it, it, you do project yourself, but it's because it, it will create a rendering based on your muscle movements of whatever of a like art, an avatar for Nikki's yeah, benefit, right. an and avatar of you that is. Yeah, that's where their their technology is. Everybody that has used it said that's that was still a little off. Uh, which is and not the surprising. The problem when That's you use any do. of this for a long amount of time is you get vertigo. I, I don't know well, if you guys- they've I've addressed been... that too. They said part yeah. of the problem when you get vertigo is, is it's not sealed tightly and the latency between what you're seeing and what's actually happening. This is supposed to improve that significantly. So there, the latency is so brief, you won't notice it. And that that will address the, the vertigo issue. I don't know if it will or not, but that's that's the claim that they made. Well, but if, if, yeah, they see, yeah. If they also address some distancing issues with the sound and putting shadows and stuff on the objects in the virtual world, which they say will help your brain not get that vertigo, which I mean, all makes sense. Hey, look, listen, the point is we're having this conversation so we can clip this later and send it to Apple and explain why it is we need review copies right. of all of this. Yeah, and also because we <laughs> want to know- I would love to get one, I, for sure. <laughs> also because we want to know when they're going to put a Vision Pro on a bear. <laughs> <laughs> listen, listen, it is, it is very, very close. Uh, <laughs> the, the vision that comes in my brain when I was a little kid, we, were, <clears throat> we went to the Smoky Mountains and the, there was this bear <laughs> digging into a garbage can and he found this mayonnaise jar and he got his, his snout stuck in the mayonnaise <laughs> jar, which sort of strikes me, reminds me of a bear with this Vision Pro device. Around with the listen, <laughs> listen, only you can prevent vertigo from VR headsets. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> This this episode is one for the record books. We need to like we, on some week when we can't make it, you might just put this in as a replay. <laughs> a rerun. A rerun. <laughs> it needs to be mandatory viewing for every lawyer on tech competence training. Uh -huh. I think, mm. uh, or if anyone's like, training. tell us about the show. What's it like? Be like, just watch this one. <laughs> <laughs> How many CLE uh, credits do we get for this? <laughs> I know it. I know it. Uh, well, you know, all. Caroline's going to be sorry she chose to go on a date instead of hanging out with us. But. <laughs>
The show's gotten very it's grisly. Probably, this is my attempt. Probably it's gotten very grisly. <laughs> I'm horrible at fun. I had to Google the word to make sure yes. it was the correct word. <laughs> oh. All right. That's we a good one. There. We have to stop there. Waka, uh, waka, waka. Wait, it's, right. it's become unbearable. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I tried. Grin and bear it. <laughs> Oh, oh bother. we can just go Am on I... with puns for another 20 minutes or so. I I'm, I got nowhere to go. No, all right. Uh, good. Well, I think that I think that does it for this show. Uh, and uh, we managed to work some legal tech into it. Uh, and we managed to make Nick Richway and happy. So what else can you ask out of a show? And uh, we'll be back again next Friday, same time, same place. And who knows what we'll be talking about then. See you then. Bye. Bye. Have a good weekend. Bye.